monsters, madness, and magic. Grant me sight beyond sight. Thunder, 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 thundercats. Ho! Monsters, Madness, and Magic. Welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. I am Justin, joined by my co-host Daniel, Mitch, and Angelique. Today we have a very special guest with us, wielder of the Sword of Omens, keeper of the Eye of Thundera, Lord Lion O himself, Mr. Larry Kenny. Larry, how the hell are you? I'm fine. I'm fine, everybody. How are you guys? All right. I'm uh, freaking awesome now. He's also wielder of the bowl of chocolate. Angelique, <laughs> who else is he? Yes. Go ahead, tell he us, Angelique. He's chocolate, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a serious case, a serious case of Count Choculitis. You know, oh, so. you really? You, 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 you've eaten that stuff all your life? I do. <laughs> and you're still alive. <laughs> yeah. I hate you know, it takes a lot of work to maintain, you know. <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been the voice of Count Chocula for just about 40 years. I think it was 79. Wow. And, wow. and then uh, 38 years for um, Sonny and the Cocoa Puffs. See, see, yeah, we can yeah. survive because we were the test tube babies of the 80s. So, I mean, yeah, we grew up with Cookie Crisp and, the, mm -hmm. you know, of course, Count Chocula. And, uh, cr and um, oh, Lord, what's the berry one? Why did I forget? Booberry. Thank Boo you. Booberry. <laughs> Frankenberry yeah. and then Booberry. So, Franken yeah, I mean, right. Frankenberry. Yeah. If we can survive we that. we were also completely unsupervised. So that probably has a lot to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that probably didn't help. But they, but they used to call those latchkey kids. Yes. That's what you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Frankenberry was voiced by uh, Bob McFadden. What a good. He was also a uh, snarf on Thundercat. Wow. Dude. Yeah. Okay. So Bob and I worked together back in the 80s. I mean, we were constantly in the studio together. Now, is that – because we've <clears throat> I've heard that from other actors as well. So was that pretty much – like your career is that it was basically you and you know a group of other people y'all just kind of ended up going to all the you know the same jobs pretty much a lot of times well it seemed like it sometimes you know because it, it it's a very small industry much bigger now these days than it was when i started back in the, well i started in radio when i was 13, 15 years old <laughs> but in terms of uh, commercials and uh you know big time stuff like that um it was always a kind of limited group that did all the work. Uh, but now you've got, you got people on the internet who are, you know, send you and send in auditions on the internet and even record commercials on the internet. So it's a, it's a vastly different world. But um, most of the time we were all in the, in the room together. Is that, is that what you were asking me? I, I you know, I mean, I was just curious, like, you know, you say you were with Bob McFadden and, you know, mm -hmm. he Snarf, and then you were Lion O, but then you were also Count Chocula, and then you were yeah. Sonny, who was Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. So you mm -hmm. probably, you know, shook hands with Captain Crunch, and then he had to skip down the block to, you know, record gummy bears with Dave Murray or something. I was just curious if it was just like four or five of y'all were like the cartoon mafia, and y'all were just, you know, going back and forth. Y'all like owned all the cartoons. That's that's basically all it was. <laughs> well, I guess you're right. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess it was a smaller crowd back then, fewer people doing most of the work. Okay. Um, but it, the only difference between that and now is there are very, there are very few people, very few times when uh, I actually work with anybody else. Now they, they want everybody, everybody in a single booth by themselves, and they might be in California, you know, they being the, the producers of the commercial, the sponsors right. too. But back when we were doing Thundercats and, and Silverhawks and all that stuff, in the 80s and 90s, um, it was a group a group deal. You'd walk into a studio for a Thundercat session, for example, and there'd be five microphones in a, in a semicircle, uh, one for each of us. And we were all in there together every time we went to record, which I like better. It was, uh, it's easier for me and most actors, I think, to bounce off somebody, you know, to, mm -hmm. yeah. to get some, re some response, some feedback on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Now it's just pretty much all you by yourself. 
And if there are other actors on the commercial or whatever you're recording, they're probably in another city, Chicago. It helps the dialogue because a lot of times, it, and you, the person writing it, the screenwriter, I mean, not that they're bad, but I mean, you know how dialogue flows. A lot of times their diction and genuflect isn't how the actors actually interact. So when you get them act, at a table, sometimes the dialogue even just grows organically and you don't even go on the script. You end up keeping what happened there as an ad lib or an impromptu session. So yeah, you're right. You got it. Where did uh, you say you started with radio? Where did you start at? Uh, I started near my hometown in Illinois. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm from a town called Pekin, Illinois. P-E-K-I-N. We wanted to be king, but apparently there's another one. <laughs> so we had to stop with at the end. Pekin, Illinois. And uh, I did a, had a radio class. I was in high school. We were talking 162. We actually had a radio class. I actually did a radio show uh, at lunchtime every day, a 10-minute radio show over phone lines to the local radio station. I didn't realize until many, many years later how lucky I was. We had that. A small town in Illinois, high school, a college, a high school with their own. And, and we had a state-of-the-art board, you know. Dude, equipment, that's you know. cool. So that's how I was lucky enough to get started. <laughs> and then one day I got a call from the, the big radio station across the river in Peoria. And they were uh, looking for a guy. And, and I went up and auditioned and I got the job. I've been was in radio now for almost 60 years. Oh, wow. Larry, you worked with, but you're not just in radio, though. You worked with <laughs> Don Imus for over 30 years, so. Yeah, 35, yeah. Crap. <laughs> how did, how was that? Were you there when Stern was there, when they were doing all, were you yeah, there when that was going on? Oh, yeah, I was there. Yeah, that was in uh, 82 or 83, I think. Oh, you got to tell us a little bit about that. If you I, was, I was fixing <laughs> since, like, you know, I worked in radio. So, oh, okay, you know, worked in radio, yeah. With Don Iam, oh, geez, okay, yeah, that, yeah, that changes the nature of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah it was the 35 years I worked. It was, you asked, what was he like? Did someone ask what he was like? And just how'd you get started with Don, and what were those years when him and Howard were kind of uh, crossing paths together? Well, uh, I'll take your first part of your question first, and then you'll have to remind me what the second part is. No problem. And I'm old. Um, <laughs> I was working in Cleveland as a disc jockey <clears throat> at one radio station. And Don Imus was at another radio station. He did morning drive and I did afternoon drive on my station. He left there, I think, in, in 72, 73, I think. He left there in 72 to come to New York. And I left to go to Chicago as a disc jockey, a morning disc jockey. Well, one day my uh, engineer from Cleveland called me and he said, hey, um, I'm, I'm working with Imus now. I'm Imus's board engineer and he asked me, he said to me, you worked at WKYC, didn't you? Walt said, yeah. He said, um, did you work with Larry Kenny? And Walt said, yeah. I just apparently thought I was better than, you know, anybody there. He really liked, he really liked what he heard me do. So now he's in New York, I'm Chicago. He calls me and asks me if I'll be on his show every day or three or four times a week for a little, this sh little short three minute bits live, you know? And I said, sure. And we started that in 1973 and I was with him until 2008. Wow. Wow. He would, um, he would call me. We both had the news on the hour on our radio station. So we had five minutes there. So he would call me from New York and, and uh, he would say, uh, we never used strips. He would say, um, let's do Nixon. Today. You do Nixon. And um, have him talking about, you know, whatever. whatever we, we did whatever is topical in the news, you know, contemporary. Stuff. And so we would do that on the phone. And uh, he would send me $50 every time we did one, <laughs> which was in 19... 73 that was you know a lot of money a lot but uh so then i finally came to new york a year later to whn with my own show in the morning and uh that's when he and i started working together we did some records for rca country music that his brother fred wrote and um that's that's how i got started with him now the second part of the question was how what was the climate like when stern was around and they were kind of mixing together <laughs> oh yes yeah. <laughs> well i was there the, i was there the the infamous day that uh, howard walked into the studio and announced big mistake uh, not the studio even don's office at uh, 30 rock <clears throat> nbc we're on the fourth floor and uh, we're all in don's huge office you know and having a pizza or something like that and uh all of a sudden, we look up and Howard Stern, who had just started the station the day before, I think. He was new, new in town. And Howard walks in with his big hair, you know, and he's 12 feet tall, you know. And he goes, uh, how's it going, Don? Well, first of all, you don't call Imus Don. Nobody calls him Don. Certainly not Donnie. But he says, uh, how's it going? And Imus looks at him and he says, that's the new kid, right? I said, yeah. He says, get the fuck out of my office. And Howard laughs. You know, he says, <laughs> 
get the fuck out of my office. So Howard did. Well, Don was half joking, but only half, you know. <laughs> it was noon, so he was probably a little drunk anyway. But um, uh, Howard had never forgot that and never, never forgave Imus for doing that to me because he was humiliated. But, you know, you know, Howard, if you, you've listened to him over the years and saw his movie and everything, he admits he, he's very fragile in terms of, you know, emotion. Right. And that didn't, uh, that didn't work out too well. I don't think he's to this day hasn't forgiven us. So all of the issues between Howard and Imus can be zoomed back in on that. Go fuck, get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> That's where it started. That's where it started. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was I was curious as to like whenever you said you were in radio, like what kind of DJ you were. I didn't know if you were like the weekly top ten and you know competition with Casey Kasem, or you know you were like the Shadow Stevens, or if you even did talk radio or something. I was just curious, but <laughs> no, you were with Don Imus and Howard Stern. You're like <laughs> crossfire, and you're just sitting right there, just probably laughing the whole time. That's awesome. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Nothing you can do. You just kind of push your chair back a little bit, get out of the way, you know, and just kind of go. Mm -hmm. We didn't have cell phones then, so you couldn't pretend to be on your phone. You know, uh, there's nothing you could do to pretend I'm not in the room. <laughs> you just do like Ernest, is that a rabbit over there? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, just pull the face. <laughs> well, the, uh, the, the best of it was, I guess, it only happened once, you know. Uh, right. One, because once that happened, Howard never spoke to him. I'm a as far as I know. So it wasn't an ongoing battle. It wasn't. Didn't have to go every in every, every day and worrying about a fight or nothing. It was long gone. I'm uh, I'm I'm curious. I'm sorry. Who did I step on? No, go ahead, Daniel. I was just. I'm curious. So while you were doing the radio stuff, I mean, you were also voicing the cartoons. This was all at the same time. So at any yeah. potentially at one time, it was you had just heard a whole bunch of expletives between Imus and Stern and then had to go and voice Lion-O and then a bowl of cereal. Hi, kids. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, yeah. kids. I got the fuck out of the office and wanted to remind you. I mean, I just, I'm just curious. So it was around about the same time? Yeah, oh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, with Thundercats, well, and, and with commercials too, um, we would record Thundercats on Thursdays and Fridays, one set of days a month, because you had to give the animators time to, you know, to animate the last ones to record. You had to give the writers time to write new scripts. So it wasn't just like you sit down and bang out 130 episodes in a month. You know, we did actually uh, two shows a month. Anyway, we would do one and on, four shows, four shows, Thursdays and Fridays, two shows each day. And after the first show, I would run back to NBC and record my stuff for Imus for the next day. So yeah, and then or there were times when. I would go do a, a commercial on my on the break from Imus. I mean, on the break from I would go back to Imus on a break from commercial. Right. So it was it was pretty busy back then. Hey. Yeah. But you know, I, I was you know twenty five and could do anything. <laughs> yeah, well, right in the thick of it. Yeah, I mean, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, didn't even notice it back then, but yeah, I was just kind of curious, man, because I'm just thinking about actually you know, like the logistics of the recording and stuff. So I mean, that had to be hectic. Like, uh, what got you into like all of a sudden, hey, I will be a voice for some cereal. I mean, was that a conscious choice or how did that happen? Well, I had been doing character voices and cartoon voices since I was a little kid. <clears throat> My mom told me at one time that she says, I, I actually think you could, from the minute you could talk, you were doing voices from that I heard on television, cartoon shows and, you know, characters, cowboy westerns and things like that. Mm hmm. I, so I was always into doing into doing voices and impressions of the famous people. And I, so when I started in radio, when I was 15, I got a disc jockey show, and I started incorporating that into my show. You know, I'd be, you know, those are the Beatles uh, here at WIRL, and oh, look who just walked in. You know, it's a joke, a joke, and then boom, Larry Kenny, WIRL. <laughs> so, so then I got to Chicago, and especially when I got to New York a year later, that's where all the commercials. And... Um, <clears throat> got an agent immediately as soon as I got to town uh, he started calling me and sent me to auditions for commercials and cartoon shows I, I even did a uh, a game show for three years bowling for dollars in the channel nine in New York yes hey, uh, you know that show it's I've heard of it it's been I'm one familiar of those, with it yeah <laughs> yeah this is what like the movies that we watch and I speak because I know Angelique and I watch a lot of the same stuff but this just that show has been parodied in a lot of yeah. low budget films and yeah. like cult yeah 
stuff. Yeah. It's all, you know, bowling for dollars and <laughs> diving for dollars and stuff like that. And, you know, bitch slaps yeah. for bucks. It's just exactly. but, so like you were the host of that show. That's awesome. Well, you know, sad to say, but I would imagine that that's where those kids in Colorado got that. I, I mean, I, I would imagine that's where the, um, there was a movie, Bowling for Columbine. I think it was Mark, Michael Moore. Yeah. That's probably why he got Bowling for Dollars and Columbine. I don't know. Oh, wow. That's, weird. Yeah, that's crazy that you had actually hosted that show. I just to yeah. be reminded, oh, yeah, that was an actual show. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it was actually done in, uh, I think, 11 cities on the country. I did one in New York for three years. Uh, Jim Lowe, I think, did one, the one in L.A. Um, two or three of those other big-time game show hosts back then also did it in area cities. But that, that left six or seven small towns or smaller cities where the show was done with a local host. And I think those are the ones that are probably the base of the parody. They couldn't oh, okay. be parodying me. What's the parody? <laughs> hey, nothing. The more we're finding out. <laughs> I can oh, hear it now. Yet. You said Lionel's voice is just your voice. And I, like I said, I can almost hear it now. Do you, would you say that your most iconic voice is actually your easiest? The very good question. And yeah, I, I think it is because... Lionel is iconic, meaning that, the, that most people know me from. I, mean, I know what the, I know what the word means. It's just that I don't want to try to be humble, you know. No need. <laughs> yeah, it's it's all right, dude. Like we you know, know who you are. You're gonna have to hide it from not us. Not here. <laughs> Wasted on us. <laughs> not working, is it? No, not no, at all. No, no, not even slightly. <laughs> we yeah. said, yeah, we're talking to Lionel. It's like, oh, that's cool. I didn't like. Truth be told, is I grew up in that. And then here I come. Oh, yeah, I didn't even. <laughs> I didn't even need to know your name. It's like podcast with Lionel. I'm there. Uh, yeah, cool. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and um, yeah, that's, I would say that's the one most people know me for. And it is the easiest to do because it's just my voice, if you think about it. Um, it's just it's more dramatic on TV. I mean, sitting here talking to you guys right now, I would say uh, <laughs> Sword of Omens come to my hand. I lie and no commend it. But on TV, it comes out Sword of Omens. <laughs> yeah. Come to my hand. I lie and no commend it. Ho! See, same guy with it. You know, different. Yes. So that, it was easier to do. As a matter of fact, when Warner Brothers hired me in 2011, they did a reboot in 2011, and they hired me to play Claudius, Lionel's yeah. father. It was a prequel. Uh huh. And it was kind of cool because uh, my voice had gotten older as I had, and it, it sounded older. You know, I was still pretty much doing voice the same way as when I was younger, but you know what I'm saying? It was naturally older sounding. Right. So... Oh, I caught it as soon as I, I watched the premiere when it came on. And whenever they showed, you know, it was like the older lion -o, And the minute you spoke, I was like, ha, 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 they got him. So that was a happy little <laughs> moment for me. Yeah. I was really happy that they um, hired me for that. Not only, you know, that they hired me, but it was an, an homage, I think, to the original show and the original cast. Because all the guys and gals who worked on the Warner Brothers version in 2011, I met them and went out there and hung out with them. <laughs> tremendous Thundercats fan. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> the lead writer and the guy, the producer, the head guy on the show for Warner Bros. said to me uh, one time, um, he said, you know, I told him uh, when they offered me that, asked me to produce this. Thing. He said, I'll, I'll do it if you, if you get Larry Kenny as Lion. If you get Larry Kenny as Claudius. And they did it. And I, I, I think it was a great homage, not just to, uh, to me, but, it, but, but, you know, an homage to Thundercats, the original Thundercats, and to the cast and, and to the fans yeah. of the original Thundercats. It, so I think it was a great idea. I've had to explain it because it, it, the more I've talked about it, just kind of, you know, working through it. But, you know, what people don't understand is, as we said, grew up in that decade, you know, both parents working and stuff. It's like, yeah, you are a significant portion of my childhood. There is there's a lot of emotion invested, like in these characters. Sure, you were just sitting there talking, but you don't understand when you just whipped out that lion-o line then. Yeah. I was six. It just, it happened. You know, it's like, and there I am six years old again, watching TV. There, there's a lot in there. And so when they do these reboots and these retellings, like when they did the remake of masters of the universe, mm -hmm. you know, John Irwin is almost pathologically shy. It's a shame, but they got as many of the people as they could, you know, from the original Masters of the Universe to do voices or at least do a guest spot. And so when they announced they were redoing Thundercats, so they had the stylized artwork. But then they were also going to be getting some of the earlier cast so you to make cameos and reprise. That's not, that is incredibly important for those of us who, you know, have so much invested in that, mainly just because of childhood. We didn't really I, I totally understand that. I totally understand that. 
as a matter of fact, at Comic Cons, a lot of times people will um, they'll, they'll be in line, you know, to get an autograph, and they get to the table and they kind of like, I can't tell you, I, I can't even speak. I'm, I'm so, you know. And I say, listen, to this. don't worry about it. I'll tell you something. When I was your age, if, if uh, when I was a kid, if I heard that Mel Blanc or <laughs> Dawes Butler or something, not that I'm comparing myself with those guys, but those were the guys. And if I heard that they were going to be in my town and all I have to do is go over and wait in line, I'll be there Monday for the Saturday show. So I, I understand that. And I also understand and I deeply uh, appreciate and hold dear, but I don't sound too corny, the legacy of Thundercat. And the main reason is not because so much it was a hit show and everybody knows it. That's wonderful. But I've gotten letters for 30 years and more. More now because of the internet and email and all of that. The people have always written me saying uh, that now they're adults and they're writing to me and saying, I just want to tell you, I didn't have a very good child. And I knew what they meant, generally, you know, I, mm-hmm. somewhat, in, somewhat into detail. But I know what they meant is that they were being abused or the living conditions were, you know, terrible, whatever. Couldn't get along with their folks. But so many of them said, but when I went into my room, watched Thundercats for a half an hour, I was the happiest kid in the world. Mm-hmm. You can imagine how that makes me feel. <laughs> so I, 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 I um, guard that legacy with a vengeance. I mean, I've been asked over the years to do so many things as Lion of <laughs> everything short of porn film, you know? And, um, well, I did the porn films. But, uh, <laughs> but I've, I've only said yes to a very few. And that was because I, I wanted to make sure that I read the script and didn't like it. I wouldn't do it. Something like that. You know, if they're in any way mocking the show or yeah. even, mocking the, even mocking the 80s, you know what I'm saying? I say, you don't need me for that, you know? Get somebody else. That's fine. Right. I just don't want to do it. I remember when um, <laughs> my agent called me and told me that Seth MacFarlane had called him. Oh boy! And asked if I would do a <laughs> Lionel on Family Guy. Now they had done they had done uh, uh, use Lionel in uh, I don't know if it was Family Guy or some of those nighttime cartoons, you know, Nickelodeon, whatever. Um, but but um, Seth had done done Lionel. He did a great job at it. But for some reason, he wanted me on this particular one. I said, okay, let me come over to your office and, and look at the, the script. I took one look at it. I said, I said to my agent, Don, I, I'm not going to do it. I mean, why not? I explained him what I just told you. Guys. Um, and if you saw the episode, you'll know why I was concerned. Anyway, long story short, my, my son said to me, Dad, yeah. you got to do that show. And I said, well, I watched it and it was very funny. It's brilliant. You know, Seth MacFarlane was brilliant. But I said, it's, you know, it's, look, I come from the 80s where Thundercats was very tame and very, you know. Now I say, I swear on there. And I wouldn't want the kids, my fans, I wouldn't have, want Lionel saying something that's you know, dirty or off color or stuff like that. And my son said, Dad, first of all, those kids, uh, those kids are 35 now. And they love this shit. You know, they love family <laughs> guy. I said, okay, so I'll do it. But if I get one email, one bad email, I don't know what I'll do. I never did, though. Oh, that's good. That's <clears throat> Are you familiar with that scene? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I don't yeah. remember the scene itself, but I know that you had portrayed yourself on Family Guy, so I was wondering how you felt. Yeah, about well, I portrayed Lion, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the deal is, um, what's, what's the lead character's name, the father? Peter. Uh, uh, Peter Griffin, mm-hmm. and apparently Quagmire, somebody else, <clears throat> were in San Francisco for some reason. You buy the premise, you buy the you know. Yeah. And they're driving along... And I guess uh, Peter Griffin says, boy, I bet you find some strange couples living in this town together, huh? <laughs> Immediately, they shoot to the interior of an apartment occupied by Lionel, Chitara, and Snarf. And, and, and the scene opens with uh, Lionel just standing in the room like this. And Chitara comes walking by and she says, uh, what's the matter, Lionel? Huh? Oh, nothing, nothing, Chitara. I, I just have a bad feeling about Mumra. I, I don't know what it is, but I know he's up to something. She says, yeah, well, I'm going to the can. So she goes in the bathroom. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Lionel takes the Sword of Omens, points it toward the bathroom door, and says, Sword of Omens, give me sights beyond sight. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. At that point, Snarf walks by and says, what you doing, you know? <laughs> says, uh, oh, nothing. Just, you know, I'm just, uh, you want to get stoned? <laughs> That's where it ended. <laughs> I remember that. that uh, I mean, it wasn't yeah. horrible, right? But no, it's funny. That, it's funny. that was that yeah. was okay. Yeah, I understand. Like, I appreciate you trying to take care with the character like that because yeah, this certain people like. Let me just put it this way: If Seth MacFarlane said he was going to do something <clears throat> funny, I'd be like, really? For the first time? 
but uh <laughs> ain't no way in hell i would have done it so yeah I, I i at least appreciate you guarding the character like that but yeah i, I will admit the scene was funny <laughs> yeah it was it was actually did you uh this is like completely jumping back but i have to i have to ask you say you were in radio so did you ever like bump into gary Busey or gaylord uh sartan sartan as no. in like Dr. Demento or Weird Al when they were Dr. Doing- Demento. No, I never met him. I know you're talking about, and of course, Gary Busey. I, I know him. Was he in radio? Yeah, they they started out with the radio stuff, but I was just kind of wondering if we had a Ernest P. Worrell, Jim Varney <laughs> kind of connection. Because if you were in radio in the Midwest and then they were, and then just I figured I'd oh, take I see. Well, that's that's that was a good shot. I I, I wasn't, but uh, but I was a huge fan of uh, Ernest. Ernest uh, <laughs> yeah. But, okay, I knew I liked you for some reason. I, I knew there was a there's a kindred yeah, you're spirit. In good company. <laughs> We're all yeah, Ernest fans. Well, I, said, I, 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 knew him. I was I was into him before he ever made a movie or, or appeared on television. Was he, he ever in radio? Us uh, too. I don't. Yeah, you two were. I don't know about that, but but I'm from the you know the Midwest, which is very southern in a way. That's you know? right. And he did he did the he made a good living for years and years before visiting TV doing radio commercial and local TV commercial as that character. And, uh, you know, not everyone would say, hey, Vern. He walked into a room and his his buddy's in the, taking a bath, you know, in the bathtub. And he says, hey, Vern, oh, I like your little duck. (laughs) 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 Hey, Vern, I like your little duck. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Lion-O doing our impression. (laughs) My night is made. Oh, my God. about how the gas company, you know, Dude, oh my Angelique, god! I didn't, I didn't hear Angelique. I think she's she's kind of dropping out. Yeah, Angelique. yeah. Internet. I'm not, yes, I'm here, I'm not my hearing. My internet is stupid. Okay, I just want to make sure we hear what you had to say. Oh, I was saying how you know he did the the gas company commercials, and he'd be like, yeah. you know, with such and such gas, you get all the hot water you ever wanted, and I like your little duck. <laughs> <laughs> I like your little duck. God no, was I want that, that was sad. He died so young. <laughs> I want Sorry. that sound clip. We gotta have that. That's just, I like a little bit. I want that. That is Larry. What is your favorite it. Ernest movie? Well, um, well, they were all. As I recall, they were all Ernest goes to something or Ernest mm-hmm. uh, meets uh, King Kong or something. Like that. <laughs> that would have been a good one. No, no, it was one. It was the one that was kind of set in the in the like in the jungle or a Caribbean island or something. Goes to like Africa, that. I believe, was the one. That, that's the one. Yeah, I think it was. The, but they're all wonderful. <laughs> so at what point when you were when you were working on Thunder, thundercats and recording it did you have a sense of the splash it was going to make well there's no way you can you know i mean in, in this business whether you're doing a film or <clears throat> a, movie, a show a stage show you know a play or a tv show uh you know when you've got great material and we knew we had the writing was great. for the genre you know it's, it's animation animated children's show but this, this was written really very well um the animators were fantastic. And when, once we heard the music, we said, oh, this yeah. is unlike any, any other music for a cartoon show, you know, a hero's cartoon show. <laughs> and they <laughs> wanted to use uh, heavy metal guitar. You know? So anyway, uh, after we had done, you know, several episodes, uh, we were, some of us were at lunch one day, I remember, and we started talking about, uh, hey, this, this, is, this show's got a chance, don't you think? And we all went, yeah, I mean, the music's great. And this is great. You know, we're all great. Um, but you never know. You never know. You probably heard this story because I've told it in a million interviews. Sometimes people say, "Well, you asked. You asked when did you know it was a hit, right?" Or you asked, "Did I think yeah. it was going to be?" A hit? No. Wait, well, yeah. At the time, did yeah, you have a yeah. sense of the impact it was yeah. going to have? After a while, you know, it grew and grew and grew, and, and more, you hear more people talking. You think so? Yeah, the show's doing well. But, but I didn't know how well until Christmas of '85 uh, or '86, and I was yeah. shopping at uh, Toys R Us. And uh, the last time I had been to Toys R Us, they had like two aisles of He-Man stuff. I may have the chronology wrong here, you know, which show came first or whatever. But, but then there, there was a Ninja Turtles stuff, you know, and then there was, you know, a half an aisle of Thundercats. But this time I walk in and there are three, four aisles, both sides, nothing but Thundercats. And I said, the show is a hit. <laughs> because in this business, if the toys are a hit, the show is a hit. Unfortunately, the toys, if the toys aren't, don't sell a lot. That's why the 2011 uh, episode, the 2011 uh, reboot of Thundercats, I think, didn't go anywhere because I was told the ratings were very good, but the toy sales expected went away. 
No, that's what it is. I mean, that was you. Yeah. You got your time. I mean, cause I can't, I was three years old at the time. I I don't know, but it, yeah, He Man was at the top, like for yeah. the longest. That made like the biggest. That's what let people know what mm -hmm. to do. And they had, to, unfortunately, it was the same like about the first wave. The first wave crashes. The second wave is always bigger. Yeah. So yeah, what He Man had to do with the same recycled backgrounds and you know the rotoscoped artwork and stuff. Whereas Thundercat, mm -hmm. I mean, y'all had <laughs> Korean artists or you had artists who were more adept in that japanimation style yeah they're, they're, they're mostly yeah it was it was done in japan oh know? was it there we, there we go yeah. and so you add done in japan. add that synth wavy 80s rocking score yeah. along with that hyper stylized artwork yeah that had not been seen before silverhawks yeah. it was close because that again has a very stylish it it looks japanese it looks like a robotech <laughs> cartoon anyway yeah. So then Thundercats yeah. comes out, and instead of, you know, the rotoscoped action running like He-Man had, you know, Thundercats actually had the sharp accentuated points where they would highlight, they would show a lens flare, you know, exaggerated posing and stuff. It just, you hit, you hit it right. It was just that right moment at the right time. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. it was destined. Well, let me uh, just quickly finish the story about that. Toys R Us. Wow, look at this, all this stuff. And I look over and there are two young guys, boys, probably seven and nine, maybe <laughs> around that age group. And I see them looking at, they're kind of talking to each other about them. one kid saying, I'm going to get Tigra because he's my favorite. The other kid says, yeah, well, I'm going to get, uh, uh, I'm going to get Mumra, the bad guy. You know? So I couldn't help myself. <clears throat> hey guys, why don't you get lion -O? He's the one who says, Thundercats. Oh, <laughs> and these two boys looked up at me like, <laughs> so I just, and I just, I just kind of shriveled, you know, what am I going to do? For, for one thing, the parents have got to be here any second, you know, <laughs> they should have been. So I start to walk away and I heard the one kid say the other one, he didn't even sound like a lion <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, you little shit. If you, only knew, <laughs> if you only knew. <laughs> and you sound like him. What? <laughs> if they're listening to this, they're banging their heads now. Wouldn't yeah. that be funny? You know, I told that story so many times. I'll bet you that at some point, one or both of them is going to hear me, hear me say that. God, that was us. <laughs> we were the, the asshole is, kids. The great part is they can't. So who's gonna tell? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no one will believe him now. <laughs> You'll get the email though. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I would like to hear from him. That'd be, that would be funny, wouldn't it? I was yeah. a, I was one of the kids in there, you know. And I, be, I think, yeah, that would be hilarious. Either I just think you're a, a big jerk off, or it was really great to meet you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> but at least I would know. <laughs> that was also during the during the height of stranger danger too. So oh, exactly, that's what I mean. Just been for kids. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, see, I live in a kind of a small <clears throat> small town. I don't live in New York. I live in Connecticut, and uh, so especially back then, you didn't worry that much. But then, you know, you didn't hear about. Of course, it was probably going on, but. I go, I go down that way. I mean, all we heard about was them stuffing razor blades and apples. I mean, it just, yeah. they're just, oh, yeah. they're yeah. I just, I assumed that it's like the t shirt or the meme you say, you know, that I figured quicksand would be a much larger problem by this point in my life. You yeah. know, it was the same thing. I figured by this point I would have had to stop, drop, and roll or shove drug dealers off at every street corner. I mean, at least one apple with a razor blade stuffed in it, but no, not at all. Haven't even hailed Satan once playing Dungeons and Dragons. Go figure. You sound a little disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? I have, Does he they sound built it up so well. All this yeah. training. I mean, everything else. I could have gone to be a doctor. I could have gone to be a scientist. No, I have to get ready for street corner drug dealers and razor blades and my apples. <laughs> no. And quicksand. Nope, nothing. Don't forget the quicksand. <laughs> Wasted childhood. What is What's with the quicksand? I, I I don't know the joke. What is but it? Anytime you watch a movie and they get in quicksand, like a that movie shit or a cartoon, yeah, there's quicksand everywhere and everything. But everywhere never, and everything. Right, and it's, who's, who's ever seen any? Right? Is exactly. Right? Yeah, there's no quicksand. That thing is quicksand. I don't think. <laughs> No, there's not. The, but according to cartoons that I grew up with, I mean, that was like the deadliest shit out there. We're doomed. It's over. Once you're, once you're sucked in, can't get you. Yeah, see? 
I just figured it'd be like the there's a meme now. You'll end up seeing it. It'll be everywhere now. The synchronicity of it. We'll start seeing it all the time. I thought quicksand would be a much bigger problem by this point. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to. What do you feed that guy? I have to swing across something <laughs> on the line or a rope. Yeah, right. What do you feed what guy? What are you talking about? <laughs> I uh, love you. But I, I love you. But I think you're crazier than I am. <laughs> I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> Angelique, Angelique, I heard you trying to break through all these guys' voices again. Go ahead. Oh, I said, you know, I, I thought I would at least have to swing across a crevasse on a, on a vine or something. <laughs> a quick stand. <laughs> Thank you. What, what, was that, what was that cartoon, Jungle Somebody? Yeah. George of the Jungle. George. Remember Jungle yep. George? Yep. Oh. Yes. <laughs> He probably didn't last long because that toy, that toy didn't sell anything. I mean, yeah, that's what it was in the eighties. It was to sell toys. That's it. Yeah. You know, it was who, one big toy commercial. Yeah. Who cares if your cartoon's any good? Does it sell toys? And you know, as long as it sells the toys, well, then you got a good cartoon. And George of the Jungle, like that's a he had to directly compete with Tarzan. That was not a good move. That's right. There were two. There was George of the Jungle, and there was Jungle George. They're really wacky. Oh, see, I didn't even know Jungle. Yeah, it didn't last for. Yeah, it was no. childish. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's supposed <laughs> yep. to be true. Well, but then back then, you know, Thundercast, you had to compete. You were going head to head against Masters of the Universe, which it was already yeah. in the downhill. But you also had Transform. So the fact yeah. that you had hit number one at Thundercats, I mean, that right, yeah. that right there says something. But I mean, yeah. you were among the Holy Trinity of well, the eighties. It, it was rough back then. Then you had Gem and the uh, what was it? Uh, God, I love that cartoon. I know, but they were tough. They, you know, kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sam, uh, Samantha Newark is a good friend of mine, Sam. She did the singing voice, or, or did she do the, uh, probably the speaking voice. So there are two people. Uh, one did the singing, one did the uh, speaking. Jim and the hologram. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. We got oh, yes. I, yeah, that Jim was like, the- Jim was awesome. I mean, just for, as a musician, that mm-hmm. cartoon was cool as hell. But the fact that it was Power Rangers mixed with playing <laughs> music, being a live yeah. stage show, just yeah. like a Power Ranger with a microphone. That was well, just like it had, cool to be the, had to be the first ever uh, show of that kind, you know, animated children's show starring a woman, I would think. Looking back on it, when you think so, Angelique? Yeah, it was the first, I think, I, I can't well, remember. Well, there was uh, Rainbow Bright, Strawberry Shortcake. That's right. Speaking yeah. of commercialism uh, and commercials and cartoons. Yeah, but again, her <laughs> right. art style, the art style for Jim, was, but, it had that uh, anime style to it. Also, so yeah. it, again, it we was one of the Josie and the Pussycats <laughs> too, yeah, but, but that was it. Josie and the Pussycats. That's right. It wasn't quite the same deal. Yeah, yeah, because they were Archie's spinoff. Yeah, we didn't know the term at the time, but Jim was basically an animated form of the manga. It's like that whole storyline where it was. It's not sh- uh, shojo, <laughs> where it's just kind of like the the Japanese basically comic book of Seinfeld. It's like a story about nothing. <laughs> with you know the shojo stuff that's essentially what jim was only had a yeah. lot of really cool flashing lights and stylized artwork and music to go along with it but yeah it was an animated show <laughs> um, excuse me what? jim was about the rivalry between jim and the holograms and the misfits yeah there was definitely a story there uh, hey, i know uh, there here was here we go Dan. good job daniel <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Like I said. <laughs> oh, gee, look, look at the time. I really have. To <laughs> Her boyfriend's name was Rio. It's like, dude, what a name. <laughs> That's badass. It's like the old line, if this party don't come clean, I'm going to put my pants on and go home. <laughs> so where'd you go after, like, doing the Thundercats and stuff? What have you been doing since then? <laughs> uh, I mean, the last 30 years, <laughs> 35 years. You can compress it, but I mean, serious, other than like, you know, you do guest shots of stuff for the nostalgia crowd for mm-hmm. us, but I mean, like, what all have you been doing? You know, like, keep it busy. What do you like to do? Well, uh, video games now is pretty big, are pretty big, and so I've done several of those. Um, anybody play Red Dead Redemption too? Yep. I'm JB Cripps on the Red Dead Redemption. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, <Marmot. laughs> Shit, I would have faced that together. That's me, and I was on... Um, Grand Theft Auto <clears throat> 4. That's right. You were a DJ, weren't you? Yes, I was. Yes. Uh, yes. You, were, yeah, you were the DJ of my favorite channel. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, it's weird. Uh, yes. I think that was the first video game I did. I'm pretty sure it was. And uh, my son was all so excited. And everything. I, I had heard of the franchise. And my son was so excited. And he, you know, he was at the time, he was 14, 15. And he, um, he got the game, obviously. And was gonna, so I said, um, 
go to the part that I'm on. He said, <laughs> you can't do that. I said, what do you mean? You fast forward. He said, no. it doesn't work that way because you have to earn your way, right? You have to go through all the places and do what you're supposed to do and collect medallions and shit, you know, and all yeah, that. Or keep <laughs> driving so, around for, you know, hours. Yeah, yeah, or earning enough points to buy this or buy that, you know. And, and so I never, to this day, I've never heard myself on that. But, um, and I did a few others too, so I'm doing that. And I've, made, I've been doing commercials nonstop, you know, since cartoons. Let's see what I have on here now, you might. Skittles commercials? Yeah. I'm the guy at the end of every Skittles commercial that says, feel the rainbow, taste the rainbow. No shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Discover the rainbow, taste. I'll be damned. That's been 20 years right there. <laughs> my gosh, I can't believe it. You still got it. Well, you know, I, I've been so lucky in this business. If you, you know, get an account, you do some commercial for somebody and they like you and they keep using you. I've, I've been, you know, I told you about almost 40 years in Mount Chocula and Sunny. And now 20 years with this. And, and I did a couple other things like that. But, um, well, the point is that uh, the longevity of it, you know, it's very unusual in this you know, you, you hear a guy on the camera who was on that show 30, 20 years ago. So I've been, I've been very fortunate. Is it more fun for you as a voice actor to replicate an already established voice like the uh, Count or do your own thing with a new voice? That's a good question. You know, there is um, gratification in both of them. Uh, for example, when I, when I got the job as Count Chocula, and, and then a year later, the one is Sonny. In, in both instances, they said, now, we don't want you to come up with a new voice. We want you to do the voice that's been the been Count Chocula. That was Jim Dukas. And he had been doing it since I was a kid, you know, basically. Uh, and the same thing with uh, Sonny. That, that had been done by um, Chuck uh, McCann and uh, for many, many years. So the, their point was, these characters are so well-recognized and identifiable and we want to keep that going. Why change the voice? If we were going to do that, we'd change the whole, get, put a different character in there. So that was uh, all, you had, all I had to do in that case. Those two cases was to do an impression of the guy before. And, you know, a lot of guys do voices, character voices, but they don't also do impressions. So that's where I think I had a little bit of an edge there. I could, I could listen to the one that's on the air now, which I had been hearing all life anyway, and, and mimic that and without having to come up with them. So there's gratification in that, in that they like my impression. So, and then there, of course, the gratification in the one that they say, you come up with a voice for them. Then, you know, and that happened a lot on, on uh, Thundercats, Silverhawks, because the same five or six of us uh, did all the voices. Every voice you hear on Thundercats in 130 episodes, it's five people split those up. We all did those. Yeah. Ow. Yeah, we had a very talented. So um, what was my point about that now? Gee, I'm really proud of myself. It's been like 45 minutes and I haven't lost my train of thought yet, have I? <laughs> or have I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't get old, man. It's a bitch. I'm telling you. That was good. <laughs> that was good. Holy shit. You were in Alan Wake. <laughs> yes, I was in Alan Wake. Yeah. I was really? Alan Wake video show. I play, and then was in that old Godfather 2 I was in. Mafia 2. I Mafia 2. Yes, Mafia 2. Dude. You guys know more than I do. Hey, IMDB. It's our job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why we make the big bucks here, Larry. <laughs> yeah, I big spent, bucks. <laughs> really big bucks. <laughs> I, I spend my time on IMDB looking to see what my daughter's doing lately. <laughs> you know uh, Carrie Kenny, my daughter? Uh, yes, yeah. I adore yeah. her. So do I. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you guys familiar with her at all? You I couldn't hear the name. Carrie Kenny or Carrie Kenny Silver. I'm not familiar. You know her if you saw her. She, uh, you know, Reno 911? Yeah, Reno 911. She's a uh, Lieutenant Weigel. Yeah, Trudy Weigel. That's your daughter. Anyway, that's my daughter, Carrie. Gotcha. I'm very proud of her. Uh, why did we mention her? I brought it up. I know and Viva name. Variety. That was my favorite. Oh, Viva, Viva Variety. I did the announcing a lot, a lot of those shows that she was in. Uh, well, they started out, she and the, uh, when she went to college at NYU, <clears throat> freshman year, somebody put a note up, we're starting a new improv group. There already had been an improv group called The Group, NYU. They were all graduating. So they started the new group. And there were 10 people, 11 people, 10 guys and Carrie. And to this day, whenever you see one of them in a movie, several of the other ones are in the movie too. Uh, they, out, of, out of 11 people, six or seven of them have become top level Hollywood people, directors, producers, writers, screenwriters, Tom Lennon and Ben Garant of Reno wrote all of the um, 
museum movies, Night at the Museum, stuff like that. David Wayne is a big director now. Uh, and it, it's just been, it was an incredible thing that uh, in this business to take 10, 11 young people, you know, when they were they graduated college together, and then 20, 30 years later, they're, they're all still, they see each other all the time. When one's doing, a, one's doing a, a movie or something, they call the other ones and say, I want you to be this character, do this. So I'm really proud of them. They used to, I remember when they were, they were freshmen, they were all uh, theater majors and film majors, you know, and uh, one of them, I forget his name, who became a top director now, Michael Jan. Oh, yeah. He was, you know, Michael, big, tall Michael. I know the name. Anyway, uh, they would be out in our front yard filming, you know, they, they had to make these 10 minute films for class, you know, your, your, your homework this week is to make a short film or, you know what I mean? Because it was, they were in theater school or in drama school, and they would be out in our front yard filming these ridiculous things. One day I'm, I'm sitting there watching television with my wife, and we hear Carrie, we recognize her voice saying, Get off me, you sucker! <laughs> 18 years old, and in my, in my quiet little neighborhood, you know, on the cul de sac, you mother. <laughs> and we go out, of course, they're filming. So the neighbors are all going, the Kenny kid. <laughs> I don't know, a Kenny kid must be in trouble again. <laughs> Just like her old man. <laughs> Larry, you got several things that look up our alley here. What are, what are these uh, Vault of the Macabre credits on your IMDb? Vault of the Macabre. Mm-hmm. Oh. You've got a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a bunch, yeah. <laughs> I was on that? Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> This is this an animated short? You've got, uh, let's 50, see here, one. 57 two, years in the business, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me more about it. Is it, is it a... Uh, uh, no, the hell you tell were me more, Tell me more about my work, please. <laughs> it says you were, the, you were the host of uh, Vault of the Macabre Presents The Fright Before Christmas, The House oh, Upon the Oh, yes, yes, yes. It was the like holiday specials. Welcome to the Vault of the Macabre. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, that's <laughs> badass. <laughs> now, where are these at? It. Like, where, where can you find these? I'm, I, I have no idea. I didn't even remember they existed. Don't ask me where you can find them. <laughs> <laughs> He's asking the guy that doesn't remember them. <laughs> Somebody with better internet, look them up, you know? <laughs> well, I know your first words were, I was in that, but where do I find that? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's got to be on the internet somewhere, right? Yeah, was it, of course it is. It is definitely you, somewhere. Can you tell by looking, is it, was it a TV show or was it a... Um, it says it was an animated short. Yeah, better huh. do it. All right, anyway, we'll, I'll find it and I'll, I'll send it. If we find it, we'll send it to yeah, you. Yeah, please you do. It. You know, please do. There's a lot of stuff, you know, I'm joking about it, but seriously, you know, when you've been in any yeah. business, 53 years, if you're an insurance man, you know, you're walking down the street, a guy comes up and says, you don't remember me, do you? You sold me a $10,000 full term policy back in 1949. Huh? Remember me? You almost sounded like Ernest. <laughs> Thank you. I like you a little bit. <laughs> uh, Larry, do you, have any, do you have any personal favorite Lion-O moments? Oh, you mean uh, on on camera or recording it or? Whatever? Yeah, whatever, whatever. Either on camera, recording, or what? Do you, anything well, stick out to you? Uh, I kind of, I'm kind of fond of the outtakes. You guys ever heard the outtakes on the internet? I haven't. No. No. Uh, I'll we'll have to do that well, after we get out of here. As soon as we finish here, Google Thundercats outtake, <laughs> and then Google Silverhawks outtakes. Ooh. <laughs> uh, well, here's here's the thing. One day. Many years ago, long after Thundercats was off the air, my son came home and he said, now, now he's 25 or whatever. He says, Dad, have you heard the Thundercats outtakes on the internet? And I go, <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, yeah, they, there's uh, all over the internet. So I said, no, they're probably not. They're probably parodies. I mean, no, it was us. Uh, you know, in any recording session, uh, anytime you got five actors in a room, <clears throat> you know, trying to impress each other and all that, when somebody screws up, you know, you're gonna, everybody's gonna laugh and, and they're gonna have to cut it out. But the engineers save all that stuff. And my theory is that these guys like, are maybe having a Christmas party, you know? <laughs> everybody's feeling good and say, hey, wait, 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 wait. you guys wanna hear something fucking funny. The Thundercats <laughs> recording session and what they really say. <laughs> well, it's all on there now. 
Um, I'll give you maybe one of them now, and then you, you, have, you probably have to promise me you go listen to them. Yeah. Oh, I'm, one yeah, is, I'm going to yeah, listen to them. One of them is, uh, <clears throat> it's me going, <clears throat> thunder, thunder. <laughs> Fuck, I started too high. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff on it. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to check that out. It's, yeah, the, check it. it's the nature of the podcast. We have to ask everybody, uh, sure, what, are, of course. what are your favorite films, and are you a horror fan? Oh, a horror fan? Yeah, yes. not, I didn't say horror. Not, not, not a horror fan. Well, you know, <laughs> I might be an actor, but I'm not a horror, buddy. I'll tell you that. Okay? <laughs> uh, I work. Uh, horror fan? I'm, I, you know, I, I know what your podcast is called. And everything. I can't say that I'm a big horror fan. I like, I love the classic horror movies, you know, Karloff, stuff like that. And, uh, and the current crop, I, I like them if, they, if they're, if they scare me or if they, if they're just dumb. I've never liked those horror movies. That you go, well, that's a guy in a coat, you know, it's a guy in an overcoat. That's not a monster, <laughs> you know, it didn't fool me. Immediately. <laughs> I think of, I know what you did last summer. That's the first thing that does that made me think of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but a good horror movie, man. I remember the first time I saw The Exorcist. Oh, yeah. Now it seems tame. Oh, oh, God, I was scared. Jaws, which I guess you don't classify as a horror movie. I would. I would, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. In terms of, did it scare the hell out of me? It scared, it scared the hell out of me more than any other movie. Everybody away yeah. from the beach. It's absolutely a horror movie. That's what I was going to tell you. When, I, when that came out, my daughter was Carrie, probably four or five. Well, that would have been about 74, 75. That's about right timing. Right? Yeah. yeah, Jaws was 75. Yeah. yeah. So she was four or five, and we were at the beach uh, in Connecticut, Westport. Carol, uh, my first wife, uh, Sharon, Carrie's mother, we saw, had seen Jaws over the weekend, or uh, Friday night. It's Sunday, we're all at the beach. I picked Carrie up, and I go running into the water, and I took two steps, and I couldn't, I stopped. <laughs> and I got, I just got, then I started laughing. I remember, and I said, <laughs> and Sharon said, what's the matter? I said, this is crazy, but I'm scared to go in there. <laughs> for her, for her, I, you know. I, <laughs> not for me, of course. Too. I'll go by myself, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a good scare, a good, a true scare. Exorcist, love that. Mm -hmm. I know I'm talking about all older movies, but there are a lot of, I can't think of them currently that my wife loves. <laughs> she married one. <laughs> well, whenever you're watching a movie, Angelique, ask him. So I asked this of all of our guests, Larry. What's your favorite movie snack? What's your go-to something you've got to munch on when you're sitting down to a good movie? Popcorn and raisinets at the same uh, classic I mean, combo. I put a few raisinets. You want, you want to write this down? I put a few raisinets <laughs> in my mouth, the milk chocolate ones, mm -hmm. and uh, then popcorn. When I'm gonna have them. chew them all nice. up together. Yeah. What's yours? Well, I, I'm more of a buffet style kind of gal. <laughs> 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 Because <laughs> you got to have your salty, you got to have your sweet, and then you got to yeah. have something, you know, yeah. with a little more body to it, you know. You so got to have like, all, the, all the food groups, right? Yes, right. yes. Got to have the red vines in my cherry Coke. Got to have, you know, maybe a tombstone pizza where I add a bunch of shit to oh. it, you know. Oh, man. Well, I'm getting hungry. We got to go. <laughs> <laughs> if no one Is, else has anything for, oh, Daniel, did I cut you off? No, I was just going to ask if you could do, let's, all right, so you're lying up. There, there are no more kingdoms to conquer. Let's pretend you've done everything. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. What would you want to do? Like a cartoon character voice, or would you want to do a live action, or what kind of movie would you want to do? What would you do if you had the option to be, you know, any kind of character, whatever? What do you want to do? If I had my pick of any role that's out, out there or whatever, what would I want? What kind of role would I want to do? Yeah. I've always wanted to play Mark Twain. Uh, wow. I love Mark Twain, and and I. Have you guys, any of you guys ever seen the Hell Holbrook, Mark Twain Tonight stage show? I have not. Never get a chance. No. He, he's been doing it for 60 years. And he's now at the age that Mark Twain was when he's doing, you know, he wrote all these. But I love Mark Twain. I, I've done it on stage a couple of times. <clears throat> well, last year I celebrated my uh, uh, 60th. I haven't done it for so long, I can't think. Last year I celebrated my, my 60th escape from the gallows. I am approaching the threshold of age. Why, uh, that's all I can remember. <laughs> Probably for the best. So, you, so you're one for stage. I mean, you, you're in radio, so you, what do you yeah. prefer, film or stage? Uh, I prefer, actually, of all the things, I prefer uh, recording in a recording studio. Recording. Um, I don't know, I just, that's where I see more at home, and uh, that's where I've done most of my work. I, I haven't done any stage shows since in college. It plays. I, 
you know. Um, but I, I feel at home, most at home in, in recording studio. That's where I made most of my success. Feel I do best, you know. But I do love trying other things too, like like these uh, um, the video games, the Red Dead Redemption Two. I mentioned to you, it was the most incredible experience I've ever had in career in the business oh. because you go there, you were there. There's this old hangar, this spaceship. I mean, they used to put missiles out on Long Island, Grumman, and it's now owned by uh, what's the name of the, the the big? You guys should know the the. Game company, Rockstar, Rockstar Games, games. Mm -hmm. and you go out there first. When you when you get there, if you're if you're not just doing a voiceover for the movie, I was playing a character this time. So you get there, and they put you in this spandex suit, mm -hmm. cover every inch of your body, put boots on, and a, and a helmet with a, a bar that comes out this way and then down, and the ca camera is in there, and your microphone is in there, and you have to act with all of that on, and you act not only that, but there's nothing real on stage. Like, like I was one episode, I, uh, I was supposed to jump on a horse. Well, they had a big 50 gallon drum barrel with a tail stuck to and a saddle on. But when you look up, when I got on that horse and I looked up at the monitors, there's a real horse. And, and me, my character with my, uh, not my face, but the, what I'm, you know. Yeah. It's incredible the way that works. Thousands of cameras all over the building. Uh, this is called motion capture. Have you heard of that motion capture? Yeah. Yes. yes. For movies like, uh, I guess it started with probably, uh, this one started with an A, Avatar. Yeah. I think that was the first one. But it's a fascinating process. That's a far cry from just, you know, standing in the booth with a few people yeah. screaming at each other. Yeah. So, so to answer your question, I think, what would I like to do now? I'd like to do some more of that. I hope, I hope I do. They seem to like me at Rockstar. Well, Larry, before we get you out of here, uh, yeah. you can always, you know, tell me to go to hell or tell me no. But every time we have a voice guy on here, we try to yeah. get a clip that we can start the show off with. And sure. if you're down for doing it, I'll send it yeah. to you right now. We'll mute our mics and you can do your thing. Oh, okay, sure. It'll pop up as a message on your screen in just a second. You can do that? Oh, yeah. Technology. <laughs> Oh, I almost muted Larry, not myself. <laughs> From Justin Young to me, privately. No, it went away. <clears throat> it's gone now. Uh-oh. Do you see where it oh, says... one says chat? Yeah, the one that says chat. It should be in there. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good for an old guy, aren't I? And this stuff, I know this chat. I know chat. I know copy and slide over. I know all of that stuff. Oh, here's something telling me that my updates are ready. Remind me tomorrow. Okay. Sorry, I have to do uh, housework. Okay. So, Monsters, Madness, and Magic. Grant me sight. Oh, okay. Got it. <clears throat> now you let me know when you're ready and I'll give you a three, two, one and we'll do it. Okay. You go for it. <clears throat> three, two, one. Monsters, madness, and magic. Grant me sight beyond sight. Thunder, 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 thundercats. Oh, did it sound and like a guy that's on a TV? Rap. Yeah. Oh, like that guy was TV? fantastic. I got <laughs> oh, that's always my favorite part of the show. <laughs> I still got it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, a lot of fun. This was great. Thank you. We'll do it again, huh? No, Definitely, thank, Larry. Thank yes, you, man. It, anytime. It's, thank you so much. It's been good a pleasure, man. Thank you good so much. You have a good night. Take care. Madness and magic. <laughs>